Um, this is the third in a series of talks I've been, been giving uh, on the Velikovsky chronology. Um, so I'm afraid there's a little bit of intro to rem remind you all about the last couple of talks and things like that. So bear with me as, as I, I go through this before we get into the, the meat of the subject, which is the Phrygians. Um, and the reason I'm talking about this is last talk I gave, which I think is a year ago, Philip sort of made a comment, something like, yes, but what about the Phrygians? And I thought, well, okay, that has to be my next talk. All this started by discussions in the journal, in review, about the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, back in his book, Ramesses II and his time, Emmanuel Velikovsky claimed that the Battle of Kadesh, fought between the Hittites and the Egyptians, was actually the same as a much, much later battle at Carchemish, fought between the Egyptians and the Babylonians. And this was discussed through various articles and, and ping-pongs in review a year or two back. Um, SIS Review 2016, uh, I think myself, Don Mills and Trevor Palmer wrote various bits uh, arguing about the battle and where it was and things like that. And then uh, a year later, a bit more on that subject. And to be absolutely fair, trying to prove that Velikovsky was right about the battle is very difficult. Um, there are some arguments that he put forward and I have enhanced which say the battle could have been at Carchemish, but there are strong arguments the other way. So all that debate was relatively inconclusive. Trevor and Don might say it was conclusive, but I'll say it was inconclusive. Um, and so I thought, if Velikovsky was right, there are various tests we can make. Because if you move Hittite history by nearly 700 years to line up these battles, then it's not just the battle, all that Hittite history has to move as well. So if we look at things after the battle, before the battle, they might clash and absolutely prove it can't be right. So basically what Velikovsky did by saying the Battle of Kadesh, normally dated around 1274, was the same as the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. And therefore, Hittite history before, after, around that time, has to be moved down by those nearly 700 years, a massive uh, shift. And so what I've been doing over these talks is say, okay, unclear about the battle itself, but what about the time after the battle, the time before the battle? What does that tell us? Now in the spring meeting 18 months ago, I looked at Hittite history 50 years after the Battle of Kadesh, and Babylonian texts from the 500 BC about, about the years after the Battle of Carchemish. And actually, they tied up remarkably well. We saw that in both histories, there was rebellion in southern Anatolia. Certain places were involved in, in both histories. Cyprus was threatened. There were, threat, there were threats of, of, of rebellion of affecting uh, north and south of Ugarit. Uh, you could see that in both histories. We identified a particular individual uh, in, in, uh, in both histories who became a fugitive in both histories. And the name, his name was rather similar. Uh, and at the end of, of, of this, about 50 years after the two battles, uh, the Hittite capital was destroyed. Um, Hattusus is the capital in the Hittite history. In Herodotus, he refers to it as, as a place called Pateria. Generally, historians believe that is the same place. So, looking at it some time after the battle, there was significant correlation. My last talk a year ago, um, I went the other way and looked at uh, history about 30 years before the battle. And the same detailed correlations came up. We found that uh, in both histories, a Hittite king attacked 
Ephesus, the name everyone assumes that the word Apasas means Ephesus, and, and uh, Priene. Slightly different names, but also besides uh, these attacks into Western Anatolia, the Hittite king's general, who, who is recorded as conquering Anatolia in both histories, had very similar names and came from a very similar place. So again, we found quite a lot of tie-up between, between the history. So in those two talks, we covered about 100 years of Hittite history, from the kings Mercilius II through to a king called Tukalius IV, usually dated in the 1300s and 1200s BC, but when you move it down, that history agrees rather well with the history around 640 to 540 BC. So what we found was there is quite a lot of support for Velikovsky's moving of the Hittite history. We've looked at 100 years and there's no great clash. Actually, there is quite a lot of correlation. And what I want to do today is go back a bit earlier in history, particularly because of, of, of uh, Philip's mention of the Phrygians, and look at, do, does the uh, Phrygian history fit? So that's, that's the real question for today. If Hittite history is downdated by these 700 years, can the Hittite New Kingdom, the time of the Hittite, very powerful Hittite kings that uh, eventually uh, um, fought against the Egyptians under Ramesses II, can that fit into, into Turkey, into Anatolia? The Phrygians would be very close neighbours, just to the west of these, these powerful Hittite kings. So how can the, hit, the history of the Phrygians of the 8th and 7th centuries BC fit into this situation? Or is there a clear clash that would say Velikovsky must be wrong? So that's, that's what I'm, I want to look at today. And here's a map to uh, show us what we're talking about. Phrygia is on the Anatolian plateau. Hopefully you can see it there, just in the top middle of the, of the map. This is a map of Western Turkey. Phrygia basically was a land based around the Sangarius River. Its capital Gordian is on the uh, eastern flow of, of the river. Um, reasonably high ground there on the western side of the Anatolian plateau. Um, Phrygia quite nicely placed because it was, it was a long way from anywhere that was powerful, generally things like the Assyrians. So the Phrygians tended to be, uh, have quite a bit of freedom. Come just to the east and there is Hattusus, the capital of the Hittite Empire. So they're quite close, they're neighbours. There must have been interaction if those major Hittite kings actually were based in Hattusus uh, in the uh, in the 8th and 7th centuries. I'll pick up one or two other places on the map because I'll be mentioning them later. Gordian, Hattusus, Gavarkalesi. This is a little place between the two and I'll be talking particularly about that because it's more or less on the border so it's, it's archaeology is quite interesting. Another town that will come up in our discussions is down here to Wanua in Hittite, actually it's the classical Tiana. Uh, Tiana quite important in our story as, as we'll see. One of those places that it's just beyond the Taurus Mountains and therefore the powerful uh, uh, country in the, uh, in the time we're thinking of, of the, uh, particularly this, the 7th century BC was Assyria, which is over this way in what we'd now call Iraq. Um, and the Taurus Mountains gave Tiana rather a nice barrier. So it tended to be free of Assyrian control. And we'll, we'll mention uh, uh, this place uh, in our, uh, when we look at, at uh, things in a bit more detail. Phrygia, further away, undoubtedly out of Assyrian control completely. 
uh, an independent country generally. So those, that's the area we'll be talking about. Another place that I will mention uh, regularly is Cilicia, which is the, the plain that we see right down in the corner of the map, uh, southeast of the Taurus, uh, is, is quite a, a, a low fertile plain called Cilicia, um, which in, again in, in the late 800s and 700 BC was controlled by Assyria. And we'll, uh, we'll mention the Assyrian governor of, of Cilicia during our talk. So that's the, the general field of things. Uh, to the west of Phrygia, uh, at, uh, in, in this time, is what's generally called East Greece, because it's populated by uh, Greek colonists. Um, the Ionians in, in the south and the Aeolians in the north. Uh, so uh, Phrygia has, as we'll see, quite uh, some interface with the Greek world. What's the time of the Phrygians? Uh, historians not absolutely sure, but typically the earliest archaeological remains that can be a applied to the Phrygians probably date to the late 9th century BC. They're thought to have come from, uh, from further west, sort of somewhere north of Greece, into this area. Um, as I said, quite, a, quite influenced by Greek culture. Um, major developments of the site during the 8th century, further rebuilding identified through the 7th and 6th. So the archaeology shows the, the, the Phrygians, a Phrygian culture to be uh, set in the Sangarius Valley for about uh, three, three centuries or so. Uh, they don't appear in historical records as Phrygians. That is a Greek name which probably comes from the Greek Bryges. The Bryges were a people who were allies of Troy in the Trojan War. And it's assumed that because the Phrygians came from further west, somewhere north of Greece, that that's probably the origin of the word Phrygians. But actually, contemporary records refer to them as the Mushki. Uh, mainly Assyrian records, but the Old Testament as well, you'll find talks of Meshech, which is Phrygia. Uh, it's, the same, it's the same word, obviously, slightly changed through uh, two different uh, Semitic languages, Assyrian and, and uh, Hebrew. Um, but So in, in the contemporary records, we're always talking about the Mushki. Some of the Greek writers tell us something about individuals in Phrygia. Herodotus talks of Gordius, who uh, gave his name to Gordian, the capital, of his son Midas, and then much later on, 150 years later, uh, Herodotus also talks of another Midas, Gordius, and someone called Adrastus. Um, historians I, th I think what I read earlier this week, one historian said that's a bit fanciful. There's no evidence of these others. The only evidence we have actually is for the first Midas. Herodotus tells us he was the first foreigner to dedicate offerings to the Greek oracle at Delphi. He, he uh, sent a throne which was dedicated to the oracle. So he's one of the first foreigners to be recognized by, by the Greek authors. Later still than Herodotus, Eusebius gives us some more detail. He says that Midas died during a Cimmerian attack and actually gives a date of around 690 BC. There is no other confirmation of that information, but historians tend to like it because the date looks about right. Midas, as we'll see, was around about 710 uh, BC, so being killed about 690 could fit. Midas, called Mitre in the Assyrian records, is the only Phrygian that we know of to actually be recorded in contemporary records. And as I said, around 715 he was active. Um, no other Phrygian is known from this time, no individual. Midas is the only one. And of course, we all know about the 
the, the, the silly Greek legend about everything he touched turned to gold and he touched his daughter and all that. Um, <clears throat> it's believed that that uh, story is based on this individual. The Assyrian king at this time was Sargon <clears throat> and he refers to Midas several times. Um, Midas was a, not a real problem but a bit of a nuisance to Sargon. He complains that uh, in his fifth year, Sargon's fifth year, Pisari of Carchemish sent messages of hostility against Assyria to Mitre of the land of Mushki. So Carchemish is a lot closer to Assyria on the Euphrates so he's worried that there's some sort of confederation of uh, building up anti-Assyrian uh, confederation. And another one he complains that Ambaris of Tabal, which is a, a Hittite uh, country that we'll talk a lot more about, sent a messenger to Ursa of Urartu, that's Rusa the first of Urartu, and to Mita of Mushki, proposing to seize my territory. So in the seven, sort of early years, seven, seven, 17, 715, uh, Mita is a sort of enemy of Sargon, though just a bit of a nuisance really. Uh, eventually Mitre decides that his en enmity to Assyria should be finished and about 709 BC uh, that Muscian Mitre sent his messenger to me offering to do service and to pay tribute. So Mitre sort of actually sent a messenger, he didn't come himself, um, uh, but he sort of makes overtures to the king of Assyria uh, and historians think, yeah, by then uh, might have probably had other problems and he didn't want Assyria to be a, to be a problem. So might have features for about those uh, eight years or so, initially a, as an enemy, but eventually sort of um, offering to, to be uh, less trouble. One specific thing we have about Mitre the cities of Harua, Ushnanis, and something that starts with, with Ab, but we, the uh, text is broken, so we don't have the complete name of the third city. Of the land of K, which is Cilicia, the, the southeastern plain of Anatolia, which Mitre, king of Mushki, had taken, I captured. So Mitre had taken these three cities in Cilicia, well southeast of Phrygia. Um, but, actually this is in 715, Sargon took them back. In fact, typical of the Assyrian king, it wasn't Sargon that took them back, it was the, governor, his, the Assyrian governor of, of K that took them back. But of course the, the king would, they, if they tell somebody else to do it, they did it, didn't they? So and that's the one detail we've got, that uh, Mitre actually had moved well from Phrygia uh, in, into Cilicia, and captured three cities. One more thing we have about Mitre, you can see this picture of a carving, uh, two individuals, the smaller uh, individual is someone called Warpalawas, who was king of Tyana, and uh, the larger figure is the uh, storm god, Tarhundus. Um, Warpalawas was an ally of Mitre. We know that for two reasons. One, when Mitre made uh, peace moves uh, to Sargon, both his messenger and, and that of Warpalawas uh, came to the governor of, of Kay to say, look, let's, let's shake hands and be friends. Uh, the other very important thing, though, about Tyana is there is an inscription there on a black stone in the Phrygian language and it includes the name Maida, which is the same as Mitre. So there is actually a text written in the Phrygian language at Tyana which is independent uh, information showing that Mitre was operating well southeast of, of Phrygia with this guy Warpalawas. So that's 
that's basically all we know about any Phrygian. It's all about mitre. Just to put this into historical perspective, um, remember all this started because uh, Velikovsky's theories on the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. Going back in history, Assyria is the dominant uh, power at this time. Various Assyrian kings going back to Sargon, uh, who, who reigned in the late 700s. Um, what I've also put up here is the land of Tabal. Now this is a Hittite kingdom in Anatolia. Historians not quite sure where it was, but uh, we saw earlier that Ambaridu uh, was, uh, Sargon complained that he was uh, liaising with Mitre in an anti-Assyrian way. Um, uh, these kings of Tabal are all mentioned in Assyrian records, but there is no evidence of them in Anatolia itself. There's no inscription of any of them, no statue of any of them. Uh, now, in my talk uh, a year ago, I identified the last one, the son of Mugalu. Uh, the Assyrians don't give him his name, they just call him after his father. That was the Hittite king that I identified as being the same as Mercilius II, the Hittite king, when we looked at the years before the Battle of Carchemish. So I believe Tabal is very important in this because, as I will hope to show you, the kings of Tabal were actually the major Hittite kings. And if we look at Tabal, oh, let me just go back and point out one, one thing more. 30 years of Casca invasion. Around, starts about 714 BC, goes on to about 679 BC, about 30 years or just over. The Anatolian plateau, east of Phrygia, was totally overrun by people that are initially called Kaska, and then later the, the Assyrians use a different name, they use the name Gimirai for these uh, tribesmen that come from the northeast. The word Gimirai ends up in uh, Greek as Chimerians, and generally nowadays people talk of the Chimerian invasion. They were, these were tribesmen from the, uh, the northeast who uh, totally overran the uh, the plateau, Sargon records that uh, in, in, in around about 710 BC he was building fortresses uh, uh, on the northern end of Cilicia against the Casca to keep them out. They had taken over the plateau and were threatening to come through the Taurus passes into Cilicia. Um, and uh, so that, that is very relevant in terms of uh, of Mitre because if you remember Eusebius said that he was killed in a Chimerian attack. Um, so uh, from what Eusebius says the uh, the Casca Gimerai not only uh, took the plateau but also moved west into Phrygia as well uh, and so that fits quite nicely what Eusebius recorded hundreds of years later of course with what seems to have happened. I said I, I want to look at particularly the kings of Tabal because I believe they, they do represent uh, actually the, the Hittite uh, emperors uh, of the Hittite New Kingdom. The last two kings of Tabal before the invasion, back in the time of Mitre basically, before the, the, uh, their area was overrun by the uh, the Casca uh, Chimerians, um, was a guy called Cully, who was appointed by, uh, as king of Tabal by, by Tiglath Pileser of Assyria about 730 BC. <laughs> he had a dreadful time. Uh, the next Assyrian king deposed him, and then the next king, Sargon, actually put him back as, as king of Tabal. So Cully uh, had, had uh, a, a very difficult time with the Assyrians, basically an, an Assyrian puppet. His son, Amberidu, who we've come across, who was liaising with Mitre, uh, was uh, 
married to Sargon's daughter. And uh, you get the feeling that Sargon didn't trust him and he needed somebody in Tabal to, uh, to keep an eye on him. And the easiest way was marry him off to his daughter. Um, eventually, Sargon deposed Amberidu as well and left his daughter in charge. And she ran uh, uh, Tabal for a, probably a year or two. Uh, we don't know what happened to her because whether she escaped before the Casca invasion or, or was killed by it, we don't know. Uh, but the very first evidence of, of the Casca uh, moving uh, and invading actually comes from the official who was there as her bodyguard in, in uh, Tabal. Uh, he sent a, a message back to uh, Sargon to say that uh, the Casca had uh, defeated an Urartian army. Not, not in Anatolia, further east. And that's the first indication that the Casca were on the move. Um, so we know she was there after her husband was deposed, um, but probably only for a year or two before uh, the whole plateau was, was overrun. One last thing on, on, on the history. Sargon, uh, quite unusual for a very powerful king, was actually killed on campaign uh, in, uh, in Cilicia. Uh, he campaigned into Cilicia in 705 BC. The Assyrian records, not surprisingly, are, are very scant on this, but it does actually say, King killed, camp of the king of Assyria taken. So it sounds as though they attacked the camp at night or something and assassinated him. Um, if you read um, Jeremiah in the Bible, um, he waxes lyrical about the death of Sargon, because um, obviously Sargon had dominated the whole of the country. The only other thing we have from the Assyrian records is the assassin was somebody called Eshpai the Kulumian, and nobody knows who that is. Uh, there's nothing in history uh, to help historians, it's just a name uh, that the Assyrians give us. At this stage, the Anatolian plateau was completely lost. The Casca Cimmerians had taken it over, and Assyria never retook it. Um, so this was pretty catastrophic for the Assyrians at this time. So that's the history of the Phrygians and, and their uh, interface with Assyria, particularly uh, at this time. But how does Hittite history fit? If we put the history of the Hittite New Kingdom, bring it down by about 670 years, and fit it into the history right next door to Phrygia uh, and to Baal, does it work? And that's what I hope to, uh, to answer with the next slides. So, the yellow is what we looked at previously, the basic conventional history of this period uh, about 715 BC with Mitre, uh, Amberido and, and Sargon. Then you get the, the Casca invasion of, of uh, the plateau during the reign of Sennacherib. They were still, the invasion continued into the reign of Asahaddon. Um, and of course, we put the Battle of Carchemish in. On the red is the Hittite New Kingdom, usually dated 700 years before. But Verikovsky said it had to be downdated. Start from the bottom. Muwatalis II was the Hittite king who won the Battle of Kadesh against Ramesses II. So if Velikovsky is right, we have to put Muwatalis II around 605 BC. The other kings going back, we know who they were. We know them in sort of rough timing but not as accurately as the, the Assyrian time much later, which is probably accurate to within a year. But notice we have a wonderful correlation already which ties the dates. The Hittite New Kingdom also has a Casca invasion. 
the plateau was overrun in the Hittite New Kingdom for a, a generation. We don't know how long, but certainly a generation, because looking at the succession of kings, uh, Tutkalius III, who was the king after the Casca invasion, or helped remove it, was probably the nephew of Arnawanda I. So there's a generation there. So Velikovsky tells us because of the, the battles, we have to put that red history by the side of this, and immediately there's a rather significant correlation. Not only is that a good correlation in its own right, it helps us tie down what the, the red history, which is probably variable by 10 or 20 years. We don't know how long the kings reigned precisely. But in our investigation, that doesn't really matter because the Casca invasion has tied it down. If there was a bit of variation, it's gone. Arnawanda I was the last Hittite New Kingdom king before the Casca invasion. Amburido, Amburido was the last Tebalian king before the invasion. It puts those side by side, and if Velikovsky is right, you can guess Arnuwanda I must be the same as Amburidu. That's a start on the correlation, but before I go any further, I want to look at archaeology. What does archaeology tell us about Phrygia and the Hittites? Gordian has been excavated by the University of Pennsylvania Museum since the 1950s. And uh, originally by, by uh, Young, and uh, his discovery has been very difficult to argue away. Young discovered four Phrygian levels uh, dating from early 9th through 8th, 7th centuries BC. And in all four levels, he discovered Phrygian pottery mixed with pottery of the Hittite New Kingdom. You can imagine historians are a bit worried about that. Uh, the Phrygian pottery must date after about 825 BC. The Hittite pottery is dated before 1200. So how do they line up? On the face of it, that is a phenomenal uh, confirmation of Velikovsky, and Velikovsky picked this one up. Actually, Young's work stands, but a lady called Mary Voigt is now handling the, the uh, university's uh, digs at, at Gordian, and she has found some, in some different digs, she has found that it's not quite as clear whether the Hittite, his, Hittite pottery is uh, uh, contemporary with the Phrygian pottery. So I think the best way to look at Gordian is it, it appears to be good confirmation of, of Velikovsky, um, but we need to be a little bit careful. So we won't rely on, uh, entirely on that. Um, there's a very good discussion of that in Centuries of Darkness, if anybody's interested. Um, I have to say, the attempt to reconcile it in Centuries of Darkness isn't convincing. Um, but it's been a, a major issue for a long time because what Young came up with is absolute contemporary Hittites with, with Phrygia. Um, but rather than just take that, let's look at somewhere else, which is, which is uh, quite a modern uh, archaeological uh, assessment. This is uh, the place I pointed out to you uh, between uh, the, the Phrygian and Hittite capitals, a place called Gavar Kalesi. Um, this is on the top of a hill, quite a, a tall hill. It's a classic Hittite carving. Some of it's weathered. You can see quite clearly we have two Hittite gods in classic Hittite pose. What you can't see is, is they're actually facing 
a seated goddess, but that's very badly worn. There is absolutely no doubt that the carving comes from about the middle of the Hittite New Kingdom. The, the way the gods are presented is uh, classic Hittite sculpture. So the monument is undoubtedly from the Hittite New Kingdom. The valley around has Hittite and Phrygian buildings with no apparent time separation. The Phrygian buildings aren't built on top of the much older Hittite ones. They're just sprinkled in between. And what's been found at the site is both New Kingdom Hittite pottery and Phrygian pottery from the 7th and 6th centuries. Now, conventionally, historians say, well, the Hittites built it all, and then the Phrygians came along 700 years later and built the other buildings. It's possible, but the actual timing of the Phrygian occupation in relation to the Velikovsky chronology is quite surprising. As I said, the, the sculpture is classic Hittite sculpture from about the middle of the Hittite New Kingdom. In Velikovsky's terms, that's about from 650 BC onwards. Had there been 8th century Phrygian pottery, it wouldn't work. It fits brilliant with Velikovsky because the pottery is exactly in the periods that Velikovsky would have said it had to be. Because the, you cannot date that sculpture back any earlier. Um, so it does tie up very well. So you now have Gavar Kalesi and Gordian saying the same thing. They both say Velikovsky was right. So that's a bit on, on archaeology. Back to the individual kings. Because they have these two Casca invasions, we can look very closely at the kings immediately before the invasion. In the Hittite New Kingdom, there's a Tutkalia and an Arnuwanda, father and son. In Tabal, which I have argued is the, is, is the same, and therefore these are the same people, the kings are called Kuli and Amberido. Now, Kuli looks like a pretty good shortened, shortened form of Tutkalia. Amberidu, Arnuwanda, similar, um, not identical, but the names are similar. If they are the same individuals, then Arnuwanda the first is Amberidu, and he was a contemporary of Midas of Phrygia. So the big question is, if Velikovsky has got all this right, Arnuwanda I, usually dated to about 1400 BC, was actually around at the same time as Maita of Mushki. I'll let you read that slide. We followed Velikovsky, we said that Arnuwanda, the first of the Hittite New Kingdom, was the same individual as Amberidu around 715 BC. And when we look at information from the time of Arnuwanda, the major su surviving text, actually it's complete, we have the whole text, nothing broken, uh, it's, it's a a clay tablet, but it's complete. And for obvious reasons, it's called the indictment of Mitre, because it's all about this guy, Mitre. And I've just picked out a little bit of it. There's a lot more information. Mitre has now sworn he has placed these matters under oath. I, Mitre, will relinquish the cities that I hold. Does that ring a bell? But when Mitre arrived back in Pakua, that's uh, 
Pakua is believed to be a place in Cilicia. He, transgre he transgressed the oaths. He married the daughter of my enemy, Usapa. So Anuwanda is writing a document indicting Mitre for his actions. And his main, he has two problems with Mitre. One, he's captured cities that he shouldn't have. And he's linking up with somebody called Usapa. So much so, he's married his daughter. But we can go a bit further. In 715 BC, according to the Assyrians, Mitre of Mushki captured three cities, Harua, Ushnalis, and something beginning with Ab, which uh, unfortunately we don't have the rest. In the indictment of Mitre, conventionally dated to 1400 BC, Mitre captured Hurla, Harmizna, and Aparhula. In both cases, it's three cities, and actually the names are very similar. When you think one comes from Hittite uh, and one's written in Assyrian, Harua, Hurla, R and L are interchangeable quite often. So that's virtually the same name. Unfortunately, the third one, we don't have the full name, but it starts with exactly the same as Aparhula, because B and P are interchangeable in the ancient languages. Even the middle one that looks different isn't completely different. Um, Ushna Nis, Hal Mushna. Two thirds of the name is actually the same. So we not only have Mitre capturing cities in both histories, but the names of the three cities he captured are very, very similar. In fact, when you think they come from two completely different sources, they're remarkably similar. One last thing. The indictment of Mitre identifies various enemies. Usapa appears to be the main enemy. Uh, his, his son is mentioned, Pigana, and it also mentions someone else called Kalamunaya. Uh, from the text, it talks about the household of Kalamunaya, but not the individual. It seems as though this guy was dead, and it's been suggested perhaps he was, perhaps this is grandfather, son, and, and son. You know, that Kalamunaya was, the, was some relation and probably the father of Usapa. If Arnoanda I was the same person as Amberidu, his father-in-law was Sargon II. Arnoanda's enemies were Sargon's enemies. Sargon's assassin was Eshpai the Kalumian. Not that much different from Usapa of Kalumunaya. That is a remarkable coincidence of names. And we haven't just picked them out through our process of looking at it. The major enemy identified in the indictment of Mitre is Usapa. And Sargon was killed by somebody. Uh, Conclusions. Our previous work had correlated about 100 years of Hittite history with the history of the 7th and 6th centuries BC. And we've now compared the earlier history going back to the time of Midas of Phrygia. The archaeology of Phrygia suggested that the two histories were contemporary, uh, Hittite pottery being found uh, with Phrygian pottery. Both histories had a Casca invasion of the Anatolian plateau uh, and if the two were the same, it forced us to assume that Arnuanda I has to be the same as Amberido of Tabal. In both histories, a mitre captured the same three cities. And we might, through the correlations, have identified Sargon's assassin. Any questions? consistently referred to the Kimurians as Casca, but there's no obvious link with the name and no obvious 
No, it's... The Sumerians are thought to come from the northeast. The Casca were around as a problem to the Hittites. No, the, Cas the Casca were the immediate northeastern uh, um, neighbours of, of the Hittites. Well, they're, mentioned, they're, they're mentioned by Tiglath Pileser III initially. I think Dadilu, uh, a leader of the Casca, paid tribute to Tiglath Pileser III. So the Casca are there, just where the Hittites always say they are northeast. But the Chimera. But are well, that's Pileser. that's the big question. Initially, the problem with the invasion is with the Casca. The the uh, the Assyrians call them Casca. I suspect. But then, after a bit, they used the name Gimerai. Eventually, in the 7th century, go down in, in the 600s, there's a further invasion, not of the Anatolian plateau, but further east, of the Scythians. And it looks like, certainly historians believe the Cimmerians and the Scythians are just two waves that come from the Caucasus. So it looks as though the closest of the tribesmen, the Casca, started it all, because all the early references are to Casca. And, and already in Sargon's time, the Casca had taken the plateau, because he's building fortresses uh, in, Cilic in, in Cilicia against them, to stop them. And Asa Haddon actually campaigned in 679 BC to stop them uh, invading Cilicia at, at Kybistra. So, there's probably, there's certainly two ethnic differences between Cimmerians and Scythians. They're identifiable separately, aren't they, in, in archaeology. Why, I guess, it starts with Casca and, and that led to further waves from, from further northeast. But I don't, I don't think uh, Sargon and Essa Haddon refer to Casca, do they? Sargon does, yes. Yes. When he, his first reference to all this is I built fortresses in Cilicia against the Kashka. Simple as that. First it's the Kashka, but then there's not much more, because it was, because Sargon died and, and, and Sennacherib did campaign in Cilicia and uh, up around Tegarama um, for a bit. But there isn't much more on the edges of, of the problem. But there's, for a bit, there's not much reference. But by the time, certainly when you get to Asa Haddon, he talks, he talks of the Gimerai. Um, his, his campaign to Kybistra in, in western Cilicia is, is a slaughter of the Gimerai. So by then, maybe because Assyria saw more of the problem, because We've been talking about the Casca and Cimmerian invasion of Anatolia, but there was a much more serious thing for the Syrians because they were invading western Urartu, and more or less settled in Urme, west of, the, of Lake Van. So, so that was the closest problem. Whether that closer knowledge of the tribesmen, uh, whether they were different to the Casca or, or whatever, but that seems to have affected the Assyrian knowledge, and they, they then are talking, using the word Gimerai. So whether Gimerai and Casca are just names for the same, or could well be a second, you know, I, I get the feeling that, that if I had to judge it, I would say the Cimmerians are probably a Casca invade, and then further away in the Caucasus, let's take advantage, and then you've got the wave of the Cimmerians. Um, and certainly, if you look at Asabius, much later, he uses the word Cimmerian, you know, the Assyrian Gimerai. Um, but at the start, at the start of the invasion, in fact, when the invasion is already all over Anatolia, the word is still Casca. Now, the, Assyri the, the Hittite records only ever talk of Casca. They, they never... Um, the, the main record of the Casca invasion was written by Hattusilis III, mm, 100 years later. Yeah, but they, they were a problem for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Because the Casca were always a 
nuisance to the to uh, to to the Hittites over a long period. Um, but as I said, from the in the 730s, 710, the Assyrians are still using the word Kaska. Do you know when in Sargon's reign he built these forts? Was it early or late? About 710. No, the date doesn't matter. When in his reign? When in his reign. 717 was the fifth year of his reign, so it's about the twelfth year of his reign, that sort of time, yeah. yeah. As I said, the very first evidence of any sort of invasion isn't actually in Anatolia, it's further east, and the defeat of, of, of Rusa. What about Mopos? About? Mopos. Mopsus. Mopsus. Um, what about Mopsus? Um, Mopsus is mentioned in, in a text in Cilicia. Um, written about this time, well, that's what I, you ought to be but to but it only says that the individual was of the house of Mopsus. No, that's a later one. No, that's the only one from this time. The inscription talks about being of the house of Mopsus, yeah. king of Adana. Anyway, I think he's yeah. The one. So, because Mopsus, because it's interesting, because Mopsus, of course has all the connections with the Trojan War and Cilicia anyway. Um, but there, there's more than one individual called Mopsus. Remember, it's, it's the Karatep bilingual, and it's written in Phoenician, which says Mopsus, M-P-S. But in the Hittite equivalent, the word is Mukshush, which isn't really different. K and P can be changed. But, but, but if you look at Hittite history, there's more than one muxus around. And you're pretty confident it's not Maita or Midas. It's not the same name as Midas and Mopus. No. No. Okay. no. no. Remember, Midas is <laughs> nearly everything in ancient history. If it's mentioned by the Greeks, we use the Greek name. We use Chimerian instead of Gimerai. We, we use Midas instead of Mita. And you see, it's written Mita or Mida. In fact, in both histories we compared, it's is written exactly the same, is Mita. Um, there, obviously in the time available, I've not gone into all the detail. There's a lot more interesting stuff as well on this. Bob? Um, it, uh, you also equated Hattusas as Teria. Sorry? You, you equated the term of the capital, the Hittite capital, Hattusas, as Teria. And um, Pateria, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> not, it's not absolutely agreed by all historians, but generally they wavered a bit and then they tend to have gone back to thinking Pateria is the same place. Because Herodotus' geography... Well, they, they've wavered the other way now because they now think it's a place called Kakeni's Dag. Yeah, I've, is, I've seen that. Then, which is west of Boris Corey. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also at Hattusas, you do get Phrygian pottery very clearly coming after the Hittite Empire. Well, no. <laughs> no. This was the big... There's the old Phrygian text in Hattusas, but for a long time, it goes back to Ikrem Akergal, the great Turkish archaeologist, that, that said, identified all this Phrygian pottery at, uh, at Hattusas. But Kurt Bittle never agreed with him. And I've got Bittle's original book on the subject, and it, it's wonderful. He, he talks of his friend Ikram, but I must disagree. And what uh, Bittle pointed out is, yes, the general fabric of the pottery is like Phrygian. So it's made in the same style, but the motifs are quite different. They are more akin to Syrian and other Eastern motifs. And that argument went on for years. And now it has been agreed Bittle was right. It's not Phrygian pottery, it's Hittite pottery. And I love it because... No, no, it's not agreed that it's Hittite. Do you know what they call it nowadays? No, I've forgotten. Tabalian. It's the pottery of Tabal. I love that, because <laughs> I've been saying that for years. It's now agree. It's, it's called Tabalian pottery, because Bittle was definitely right. Same sort of fabric, 
which you'd expect from two places close to one another, but it is different. It is much more akin to, in its motives, to northern Syria, which of course was a Hittite area as well. And that's why they call it Tabalian, because <coughs> Tabal's the nearest place. You, th there's another background to all of this. Nobody quite knows where Tabal is. I wrote a, an article several years ago now for SIS, using the evidence to say where Tabal is. And if you use the evidence, it's slap bang up around Hattusas. But there were kings of Tabal all the way through the 9th and 8th centuries. So it can't be around Hattusas because there's a 500 year dark age. The Anatolian plateau has no archaeological evidence from 1200 BC to about 700. So historians can't put it where they'd like to put it. So they put Tabal, when you see Tabal written on the map, it's put at the bottom around the Halis. They can't put it around Hattusas because the archaeology denies it. Of course, when you remove the Dark Age and bring all the Hittites down, it ain't a problem. Um, Tabal, is, Tabal is a real issue. But yes, the pottery is now called Tabalian. I'll have to check that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love, well, you know, I've been arguing Tabal was the home of the Hittite Empire for years, and for them to call it Tabalian is wonderful. <laughs> But you would agree that <coughs> Hattusas Bogus Khoi is the Hittite capital for most of the... Empire. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, there, the, after the Hittite occupation, there, there is there's a series of, of further um, occup, occupation. Hattusas never gets a big place, but it, 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 it's a terrible little place after uh, uh, dated somewhere around 700. I, I think once you put the Hittites there, you have to. I've looked quite closely at, at what comes after the Hittites, and it fits. There's only three levels, and they stretch for about 200 years. If you say the Hittite capital was destroyed about 550 BC, the archaeology looks a lot more sensible for afterwards. Then there is more Phrygian evidence. Um, but, um, but there's a lot of complication there because all the early settlement after the destruction, apparently 500 odd years after the destruction, um, is a very small sort of squatter type place which goes on for far too long. There's, there's all sorts of interesting things there. But I don't think there's a problem uh, with, with bringing Hittite history right down to about 550 BC. The archaeology will fit quite well. And it does make the, the post-Hittite levels look a lot more sensible. Uh, but that's a big story. A bit of a problem here, because Sargon's daughter was married to Sennacheri, and you put her husband into your Kabul No, 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 no. She was definitely married to Sennacheri. Sorry? Because as it happened, was the grandson of Sargon. Yeah, but Sargon didn't have only one daughter. <laughs> There's a big problem that Hittite historians have with Arnuwandus. He was the son, he always calls himself the son of, of, of Tutkalius II. But Arnuwandus' wife is always referred to as daughter of the king and historians get really confused about this because the Hittites were absolutely against any form of incest it, <coughs> even with cousins it was punishable by death so you think it's son in law not son well when you look at Arnuandus and Tutkalius and, the, and there's quite a lot Tutkalius got a lot of animals they never refer to themselves as king it's always my majesty. I think daughter of the king means daughter of the great king, the king of Assyria. Historically, you'll read in some books that Arnuandus was adopted by Tutkalius. There's no evidence for that, but it's a way of getting around the incest problem. Yeah. Were you trying to ask a question? No. <laughs> 
Persians called the Scythians, which is a Greek word, the Saka. And the Saka are not that. The Scythians, yeah. It, the Scythians in the Bible are Ashkenaz, aren't they? Um, mm. But the Scythians only appear no, much later. about. Uh, they're they're very evident, and Herodotus writes a lot about them, don't they? About invading Palestine and all sorts in the in uh, in the later 600s. But the Scythian the Scythians were. The Scythians in, uh, were part of the wave that um, invaded Urartu and, and even further east, almost towards sort of Persia in that way, Lake Urmia and down that way. And the Scythians are, are, were undoubtedly, what happens to, to the Cimmerians and the Scythians basically is they're more or less defeated and they become mercenaries of the, uh, of the Hittites and, and the Urartians. And there's definite evidence that uh, there were Scythian uh, legions within the, the army of, of, Urart, of Urartu, certainly Rus of the, the uh, second, which is coming down more sort of 660, 650, like that. Um, but the Scythians don't appear to have been involved at all in Anatolia. They only ever, they only ever talked of the Casca and the Gimerai as being in, uh, in Anatolia. Yeah. Okay? Yes, good ideas, lunchtime. <laughs>